Thank you, Rob, for uh, the very kind introduction. Um, thank you also to uh, Pamjan for inviting me to, um, to give a presentation at this um, exciting meeting. Um, I'm the second Scandinavian here today. <laughs> so, um, and that's good. Um, uh, the given, given title of my topic, given by Rob, <laughs> is a response prediction in local advanced rectal cancer. Um, and um, I thought of starting out quite basically, uh, since I knew there would be a lot of disciplines present, not so many oncologists. <laughs> so, um, and don't have a point or so, we'll do like this. You see the rectum is um, is the last part of the of the large bowel um, but when looking at, at this very simplified perfect here yeah <laughs> looking at this very simplified um, um, uh, illustration here doesn't doesn't explain why uh, rectal cancer is a challenge and also such a very very interesting disease to treat then we have to take a look at the pelvic anatomy. Here is a uh, female um, pelvis and a male pelvis. And you know, uh, as you see this very young uh, woman, she has opened up her abdomen. You can see all the intra-abdominal organs, the liver, um, stomach, all the intestines, the small intestines, seven meters I've learned, <laughs> and then the, the colon. And this is, this is um, a sagittal view, like this. Um, where you see the uh, organs of the pelvic cavity, uh, the rectum, and since it's a woman, it's the uterus, uh, cervix, vagina, and this is the urine bladder. Uh, the reason why I've also included a male pelvis is that this illustration um, uh, shows, and this is a man, because this is the rectum, this is the urine bladder uh, prostate here. Um, uh, here, all the intra-abdominal uh, organs are taken out, uh, and you can see this um, peritoneal lining, it's called. Uh, it's a membrane that is, um, that is uh, covering all the organs in the abdomen in order to make these organs slide without friction against it, it, each other. If you didn't have this peritoneal lining, you would have abdominal pain continuously. That would be bad. But as you also can see, hopefully, is that this lining, this peritoneal lining, is stopping here. This, this is called the peritoneal uh, reflection. And all the organs within the pelvic cavity, they are not covered by this lining. And this means, this is the point, that when, um, when uh, there is a locally advanced rectal tumor here in the rectum somewhere, um, it grows out through the uh, rectal wall, and there is no boundary to, uh, towards the neighboring organs within the pelvic cavity. So it's extremely easy for that tumor to, to grow directly into neighboring organs uh, in, in the pelvic cavity, for example, the cervix in, in a female or the prostate in a male. And this is basically the reason why treatment of locally advanced rectal cancer is multidisciplinary as uh, Irene was touching upon uh, uh, in her introdu uh, in intro introduction. The treatment of local advanced rectal cancer is multidisciplinary. Uh, a lot, lot of disciplines are involved. First, the, um, commonly the, uh, the, uh, the surgeon will do uh, an endoscopy to look uh, within the, the lumen uh, of the rectum to see the, uh, the huge uh, rectal cancer here. But uh, this in endoluminal um, uh, illustration doesn't, doesn't explain uh, or doesn't show, actually, uh, that, uh, this, uh, that this uh, tumor is growing into uh, neighboring organs within the pelvic cavity. So we need um, the radiologist to um, prepare a nice um, MR, pelvic MRI. And you can see here this very huge uh, local advanced rectal cancer um, growing through the rectal wall and into the neighboring um, organs in the pelvic cavity. This, this is a male ca uh, pelvic cavity and also a lot of uh, pathological lymph nodes. So this patient cannot be 
operated directly by the surgeon. This patient needs someone like me, uh, oncologist, to, do, to, uh, to provide pre-operative, before the operation uh, treatment, which is chemoradiotherapy, in order to shrink that tumor so that the surgeon afterwards can, uh, can remove the tumor um, with, with free margins. I also thought of oh, giving a few uh, words on tumor hypoxia, because that's a very central biological feature of huge tumors, huge solid tumors, like, uh, like a local advanced rectal cancer. Um, tumor hypoxia means that the oxygenation level of the huge tumor is not optimal. Uh, when, when the tumor is big, uh, many parts of the tumor are hypoxic, not well oxygenated, uh, and this, uh, this will cause the production of a, a transcription factor called HIF-1, hypoxia inducible factor 1. HIF-1 is produced all the time by all um, tumor cells, uh, and it's also broken down all the time, so, so the half-life half is only five minutes in well oxygenated tumor cells. But in hypoxic tumor cells, the, the breakdown is stopped so that uh, HIF-1 alpha is stabilized and can act as, uh, as a trans transcription factor. And many genes uh, have a HIF-1 response element uh, uh, in them. Uh, among, uh, among these genes are the gene encoding the vascular endothelial growth factor, for example, genes encoding uh, factors for proliferation, for metabolism, etc. So a hypoxic tumor uh, will have a huge angiogenesis. Uh, uh, the proliferation will be, uh, will be huge and also the metabolism. And all of this uh, makes, for example, local advanced rectal cancer, this huge tumor, uh, much more resistant to the, uh, to the oncologic therapy, to the chemoradiotherapy. And it also makes uh, uh, this tumor uh, or gives uh, this tumor a higher propensity to form metastatic disease. This is a liver full of metastasis. So uh, this was the background why we back in um, seven years ago, I think it was October 2006, uh, opened our study to look at what does tumor hypoxia do in local advanced rectal cancer. The study is called LARC RRP, Local Advanced Rectal Cancer Radiation Response Prediction. And we enrolled uh, 113 patients prospectively until May 2009. And we are going to follow up all of these patients for five years after, after the surgery. So uh, the study is not finished yet. Um, so um, uh, the, the basic idea was to, that the tumor biology at the time of diagnosis um, would show um, biomarkers uh, that could, that could uh, or might, um, might predict the treatment response to the chemoradiotherapy. We also have um, a second leg uh, in, in, this, in this study where we are looking for biomarkers for treatment toxicity, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So um, biomarkers for uh, um, treatment response. Before I start showing uh, three, um, uh, three um, uh, works we have done on the PAM ship, uh, using the PAM ship technology in this study to, to look for biomarkers, I thought also I would say a few words about radiotherapy, since I guess not all in the audience is, not everyone is as acquainted to radiotherapy as, as, as I am. Um, this lady is going to have radiotherapy. She's uh, laying within, um, within a linear accelerator. She's a modern uh, radiation equipment uh, producing high energy radiation that comes out here from the gantry. And it will go down into her, uh, I guess she has a tumor in her pelvic cavity. Or I guess she's just a model, but anyway. <laughs> So, um, so um, uh, the point with the, with, the, with the high energy radiation is to make massive DNA damage, massive damage on tumor DNA. 
and as we all remember from biochemistry, even me, <laughs> is that single-strand DNA breaks are quite easy to repair because the, um, what do you call it, the complementary strand hmm? <laughs> uh, uh, is used as a template, so it's quite easy to repair single-strand DNA breaks. But the high energy radiation that comes out here will cause double-strand DNA breaks. And those, uh, that damage is so much more difficult to repair, and especially for a tumor cell, because a tumor cell uh, um, uh, uh, is very busy. It, uh, it wants to cycle very quickly through the cell cycle to divide and grow into a big tumor. So the tumor cell does not have time to, to, to repair all the double strand breaks that the radiation is, is um, producing uh, on its DNA. So it will enter the mitosis of the cell cycle with a lot of unrepaired DNA damage, and then it will die a um, mitotic cell death. And that's, that's, the, um, that, that's what I, as a radiotherapist, want, uh, want that uh, will happen with the, with the tumor. So that's basically classic radiobiology in one slide. And the cool thing is that classic radiobiology is so, so um, tightly connected to uh, molecular uh, biology uh, in terms of activated signaling pathways, for example, um, illustrated here by activated uh, or pathway signaling that is activated by the DNA damage itself or further downstream in, uh, in, in the tumor cell, for example, um, uh, by the epidermal growth factor receptor. I will come back to this shortly. So, uh, what we did in our, our study, LARC RRP study, to uh, try to identify tumor biomarkers for, for treatment outcome, was uh, that we uh, had all the uh, study patients had their tumors biopsied at baseline at the time of diagnosis. And the basic idea was that um, tumor signaling within the tumor at the time of diagnosis could predict the treatment outcome of the chemo radiotherapy. Treatment outcome as assessed by the pathologist, by the study pathologist. But since now already we have, like, I think, the median follow postoperative follow-up time for the patient population, so the population is um, about four years. At this time, we uh, also know pretty much which patients uh, would and which would not develop metastatic disease. So we can also look at um, and tumor signaling at the, at the time of diagnosis to see whether we can find biomarkers for the development of metastatic disease. So first, uh, the first uh, paper uh, or the first work where, where we used um, the pam ship technology in this study population was to look at um, tumor signaling and correlate that to the treatment outcome of Oh, chemo radiotherapy. And we were not the first ones to, to, to have this uh, great idea. Um, this paper was uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2006, which actually gave us the idea. Um, and this was a landmark study uh, that changed uh, um, uh, treatment of patients with uh, this patient population, which is patients with local advanced head and neck cancer. Uh, local advanced head and neck cancer is treated by radiotherapy alone, no surgery, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the treatment outcome or the survival outcome is quite poor. As you can see here, uh, the median um, uh, survival outcome, and this is disease-free survival, is 15 months or less, so it's uh, not it's not so successful. So what Bonner and co-workers did was that they randomized patients with local advanced head and neck cancer to radiotherapy alone, which was the standard treatment, or radiotherapy plus cetuximab. And cetuximab, as you all might know, is an anti-EGFR antibody that effectively shuts down signaling mediated by the epidermal growth factor receptor. And look what happened. 
uh, the combination of radiotherapy and cetuximab significantly improved survival outcome, uh, disease-free survival from 15 months to about 24, 25 months compared to the radiotherapy alone group. So tumor kinase activity is certainly closely linked to tumor kinase signaling. No. Yeah. You know what I mean, to radiotherapy. <laughs> And uh, why are we interested in this in local advanced rectal cancer? Because um, the response to chemoradiotherapy can vary very much from a complete response on the one hand to a non-response on the other hand. And this is a good responder, a patient man with a good response to chemoradiotherapy. You can see this is the tumor at the time of diagnosis and this, uh, on this MRI. And this MRI is uh, taken after the patient has completed the chemoradiotherapy right before the operation, before the surgery. And there is no tumor back here, only a tumor scar. So this is a complete responder, a success for an oncologist. This is not a success. This is a patient with poor response to the uh, chemoradiotherapy. You can see the tumor at the time of diagnosis and the tumor after the patient ha has been through the chemoradiotherapy. It's exactly the same size, so there is no response. And also in terms for the, for the pathologist can score the response, the histopathologic response or histomorphologic tumor regression grade that can vary between complete response on the one side to and non-response on the other side. You see here, this is a complete response, only fibrobras or fibrosis left, no tumor left here. And this is a non-responder. Here, are on, uh, this is only tumor left, and there is no sign of, there, there are no fibroblasts here, no sign of, of a response, and the pathologist cannot, cannot say actually that this patient has been through chemoradiotherapy. So what we did then in our first uh, paper where we used the PEMSHIP technology uh, on this um, study population was to look at uh, baseline tumor kinase activity, correlate this to the histomorphologic tumor regression grade or the histopathologic response. We analyzed, I think it was 65, the 65 first patients of the study. Uh, first uh, test panel of 24 patients' tumors and then we validated our, uh, these findings in a validation panel. And what we basically found was that patients with good response to the chemoradiotherapy had a low tumor kinase activity at the time of diagnosis, and this was weakly inhibited when we added onto the array the anti-angiogenic uh, drug sunitinib, which might mean that these uh, tumors had a low tumor angiogenic activity because they were well oxygenated, no hypoxia. We don't know that because it's extremely complicated to measure tumor hypoxia uh, uh, in patients and in a clinical trial, so we don't know, but that's a hypothesis as, at least. Whereas uh, patients with poor response to the chemoradiotherapy, they had a high tumor kinase activity at baseline that was strongly inhibited when we added uh, onto the array uh, the sunitinib drug, which might mean that these tumors had a high tumor angiogenic activity because they were hypoxic. And when we looked at which signaling pathway could best discriminate between good and poor responders to the chemoradiotherapy, it turned out that these pathways were um, mediated by the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor, by the epidermal growth factor receptor, and by PI3 kinase AKT. And high activity in these pathways have been shown to mediate radiation resistance in experimental tumor models, and I think this was the first or among the first papers that showed that this was also, the, the, also true in, in the real life in, in patients. So we thought this was a very cool finding. 
So the take-home message from, from this first paper is that patients with poor response to the preoperative chemo radiotherapy had a high tumor kinase activity that was mediated by EGFR, VEGFR, and PI3 kinase AKT. Uh, I see now that I have forgotten to include uh, a slide here because we also show that uh, these tumor phosphosubstrate profiles that we were identifying were associated with correct prediction of the outcome of chemo radiotherapy in 85% of the patients, which is, of course, not very good, but it's not poor either. It's 85%. So the second um, paper where we used the PAM-SHIP technology on this study population was to look at tumor kinase activity at baseline at the time of diagnosis and whether this could correlate to whether the patients had or did not have micrometastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. And why is that? Tumor angiogenesis is closely connected to tumor metastasis, to metastasis of the disease. In a, sm a small tumor is well oxygenated. So even the central cells here are well oxygenated. But a locally advanced tumor, local advanced rectal tumor, for example, is so big that uh, m many, many areas within this, tumors, within this tumor are hypoxic, and the HIF-1 transcription factor is, um, is stabilized, and it will um, uh, produce, and uh, the tumor will secrete a lot of androgenic factors that will cause nearby capillaries to start sprouting, to, to start um, producing new tumor capillaries. And these tumor, newly formed tumor capillaries are not well functioning. They are leaky. Um, uh, so it's quite easy, actually, for, for a tumor cell detaching from the, from the main tumor to traverse uh, into the lumen of the newly formed capillary. And uh, in principle, then, this tumor, it's within the systemic circulation of the body, and it can circulate to any organ and set up a metastatic tumor within any organ of the body. So I said these newly formed tumor vessels are non-functional in a way. Uh, uh, he, he, here, is a normal, here is a normal capillary. Um, uh, this electron microscopy uh, picture here, I, I included it because you can see uh, how a capillary, a normal capillary is built up. It's the endothelial cells, the endothelium in the middle here. And outside there are, are um, pericytes, uh, which are cells that, that are kind of embracing the, uh, the, um, the capillary. So it's not leaky. Um, a hypoxic tumor uh, secretes angiogenic factors, and there are newly formed, um, uh, newly formed capillaries. And these newly formed capillaries are not covered by pericytes. The pericytes here in this normal capillary are the gray guys here. Uh, and here in this illustration, you see a, a green pericyte, a single one, in a tumor capillary. Most of the capillary is just uh, endothelial cells, leak endothelial cells. So it's easy for the tumor cell to, to traverse and get into the circulation. And I want you all to keep the, um, this in mind with the parasites until I, uh, I come back to the, um, uh, to the data a little uh, later. Because first I have to tell you how we, uh, how we uh, diagnosed disseminated tumor cells, or micrometastatic cells, in our study patients. We looked at disseminated tumor cells in their bone marrow at the time of diagnosis using, uh, using uh, a technique uh, that is called immunomagnetic target cell selection. So the study patients had their bone marrow from the hip here um, aspired at the time of, uh, at the time of diagnosis. And uh, we looked for disseminated tumor cells using this technique that uh, was um, uh, developed at the Department of Tumor Biology, where I do most of my lab work. I'm still doing a little lab work. <laughs> um, 
the technique was developed like 20 years ago, I think. So the, uh, basically what's happening is that the bone marrow sample is put into a test tube and mixed with um, uh, super paramagnetic beads, the red dots here, the beads. And these beads are covered with um, an antibody that specifically binds epithelial cells. And the only epithelial cells that can be present in the bone marrow of these patients are circulating or disseminated tumor cells from the rectal cancer. So this, uh, this uh, sample is incubated and we put it into a strong magnet and discharged what's not born to the magnet, and then we can look at what's born to the magnet, the immunobeads on the microscope. And we can see here the immunobeads are binding here um, a disseminated or circulating tumor cell. So this patient had, uh, was positive for disseminated tumor cells. So what we found uh, in our study population was that the presence of disseminated tumor cells was a strong biomarker, at the time of diagnosis, was a strong biomarker for a later development of metastatic disease, which was not too, too unexpected. Whereas patients that were negative for uh, disseminated tumor cells did not uh, develop metastatic disease, except one, but I think uh, that patient was a false negative. So we asked then, what were the baseline tumor uh, kinase activity that could, um, uh, that was associated with whether the patients were positive or negative for disseminated tumor cells. You can see here, I think we analyzed 55 of the study patients with the pam -ship technology. So here are the, the samples, uh, patients' tumors. And you can see which patients are positive and negative for disseminated tumor cells. And when we did the pam -ship analysis, we found that patients that were negative for disseminated tumor cells had tumor kinase activity that could easily be inhibited when we added the anti-antigenic drug sunitinib onto the array, which was a little bit perplexing or bewildering for us first before we started to think about the pericytes. But this is what we found. Uh, and uh, patients positive for disseminated tumor cells had an autonomous tumor kinase activity that was not able to inhibit by adding sunitinib onto the array. And when we looked at which um, signaling pathways were active in the negative patients and could be inhibited by sunitinib, those were pathways mediated by platelet-derived growth factor receptor, and again by VHF, VHFR and by erythropoietin receptor. And high activity in these pathways um, is uh, closely uh, or is very central in tumor angiogenesis. Pericytes express high levels of uh, platelet-derived growth factor receptors. So the, uh, the way we interpret this data is that tumor parasite activity that is easy to inhibit <laughs> with sunitinib um, mediates, um, uh, mediates um, a tumor activity um, uh, that is forming uh, fully functional, um, uh, fully functional uh, capillaries, capillaries uh, containing parasites that, that are embracing uh, the, uh, the endothelium so that um, these patients have fully functional capillaries within the tumors that are not leaky and these patients do not develop metastatic or micrometastatic disease. I don't know if this made sense, but we thought a lot of it, and that was our interpretation of the data. So the take-home message here was that, patient, that patients that were positive for disseminated tumor cells at the time of diagnosis had a poor metastasis-free survival. That was not um, uh, unexpected. Uh, and we also showed that uh, tumor phosphor or uh, uh, the phosphor substrate, arrays of phosphor uh, substrate profiles were, that were sensitive to sunitinib inhibition was found in uh, patients that uh, did not set up micrometastatic disease. And this brings me to, um, to, the, third, um, to the third work that was actually yesterday accepted for publication. 
um, uh, that, uh, where we have used the PAM ship technology in this patient population. I don't know how I am time-wise. Time Oops, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, metastatic um, colorectal cancer is one of the few um, um, conditions in oncology where we actually today use uh, tumor biomarkers for selecting patients for, for therapy, and that's the anti-EGF therapy, uh, antibodies, cetuximab and panitumumab, which in uh, unselected patients, which in, in selected patients will uh, give a good response, like here, that liver metastatic disease almost, um, um, almost uh, 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 disappeared in this patient. Uh, and in this patient, he had um, a long metastatic disease, and he did not respond. Um, and um, the um, biomarkers we use um, uh, today in clinic is uh, uh, tumor uh, gene aberrations. That is uh, uh, mutations in the genes encoding uh, RAS and RAF, KRAS and BRAF. We also know that um, the gene, gene mutations within uh, PI3 kinase, the catalytic, um, catalytic um, domain of the PI3 kinase, can, be of, uh, can predict patients for this therapy and also uh, amplification in uh, EGFR itself and RB2. And when we look at the unselected patients, if we, uh, if we treated them with uh, anti-EGFR therapy, about 36% will, would respond, the uh, bright uh, blue guys here, and 64% would be um, non-responders. And uh, both among responders and non-responders, there are known gene aberrations, and there are also uh, um, a lot of patients where we do not know any about their uh, tumor genes to be used as a, as a biomarker. So our thought was then, our idea was that the tumor kinase activity could somehow correlate to, uh, to uh, the gene aberrations uh, found in the tumors of these uh, patients. And first we uh, analyzed uh, the frequencies of the gene aberrations and the frequencies uh, were according to, the, to what was published in the literature previously, so that was good. Uh, what we did here was that we looked at tumor kinase activity and um, uh, tried to see whether how this correlated to um, whether the genes were wild type or mutated for KRAS and BRAF. And we used, um, we used uh, principal component analysis followed by something called K-means clustering, which is far beyond my competence level. This is done by Rick Devine. <laughs> Uh, but what Rick found here was that uh, this, uh, based on the tumor kinase activity, these uh, 65, I think it was, patients clustered into two groups, a larger group uh, denoted by um, squares and a smaller group denoted by uh, circles here. And both groups contain tumors both with and without KRS and BRAF uh, mutations. And uh, the distribution of the mutation status was equal in the two groups. But what was not equal was the pattern of development of metastatic disease. Because the cluster group one, the, the larger cluster group, had a um, kind of expected pattern of development of metastatic disease. You can see here that about 20% had developed metastatic disease by three years of postoperative follow-up. Whereas the cluster group two, the smaller cluster group of patients, had a particular aggressive disease um, uh, uh, disease outcome where uh, half of the patients had developed metastatic disease already by less than one year of uh, follow-up. So a very aggressive disease here. And then we looked at which, uh, which uh, signaling pathways could best discriminate between the cluster group one patients and the cluster group two patients, it turned out that it's not easy to see. But um, um, peptides on the array that uh, were representing um, uh, proteins within the PI3 kinase pathway were on the top here. 
and they could uh, very uh, they uh, discriminated very much between the two cluster groups, whereas peptides representing um, proteins within the RAS-RAF signaling pathway were at the bottom, and they didn't discriminate that well between the two groups. So the take-home message here was that um, uh, the ex vivo uh, phosphopeptide profiles, the pam shift array profiles, they find two tumor classes or two classes of patients uh, that both consisted of cases both with and without uh, KRS and BRF mutations. But what we observed, as I said, was that high activity mediated by the um, phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway and AKT uh, was uh, associated with a particularly poor metastasis-free survival of these patients. So the, um, the natural question to ask now is whether these patients should have been treated postoperatively with a PI3 kinase inhibitor or an AKT inhibitor or mTOR inhibitor. So that would be very exciting to do a clinical study like that. I think I uh, kept my time. This is my second uh, last slide, just to uh, summarize. Hope I have convinced you now that um, in local advanced rectal cancer, hypoxic signaling pathways, hypoxic signaling is um, signaling uh, that mediates proliferation, high proliferation, high angiogenesis, and also development of metastatic disease, which we have found using uh, the pam ship technology. And uh, finally, the names of all the persons that have contributed in this uh, particular research. Uh, you can see three here from, um, from Pamjan, Pete, Rick, and Rob. And all the, I was to say patients, I mean my colleagues <laughs> back in Oslo. <laughs> Uh, and uh, hopefully no patients here, and um, also the agencies that have um, supported our research. And since uh, I'm following uh, Irene, I would like to point on uh, the framework program seven. <laughs> so um, thank you for your attention.